Emily, thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming uh, this evening. Uh, I've been around a long time. I don't think I've ever been called a fixture. Uh, but I have to <laughs> learn to deal with that uh, at any rate. Uh, and I um, thank you again, first of all, for coming to join me uh, in honoring a great American patriot and a man who's made a great contribution to uh, world peace, uh, the Honorable Milan Panish, former Prime Minister of Yugoslavia. Um, but first, before we get into that, I have to say it is such a thrill for me and I hope for you to be here at this incredibly great bookstore called The Strand. Uh, I don't know whether it's your first time or not. It's not my first time. I never come to New York without coming to The Strand and coming to this floor because this is where the rare books are and this is where I spend too much money. Um, but uh, as an author uh, and a TV commentator, I've been in all, all, so many bookstores around the country and done a lot of book signings and a lot of book talks. And I think with, uh, there are three great bookstores in this country. Powell's in Portland, Politics and Prose in Washington, D.C., and The Strand in New York City. An independent bookstore, and may they long live. So thank you. It's great. Uh, I'm going to start with a little story. Thursday, last Thursday evening, my wife and I had an occasion in Washington uh, invited to a rare event. It was the unveiling of a portrait of former President Bill Clinton at the Danish Embassy in Washington, D.C., which happens to be right across the street from President Clinton's and Hillary Clinton's home in Washington. Uh, an unveiling of this portrait, and President Clinton was in good form, and he spoke. And he talked about the, some of the things that he was proudest of as president. And he said, among them, he talked about helping bring peace to Bosnia, helping bring peace to Kosovo, and about the Dayton Peace Accords, which brought peace to the Balkans. And I said to him afterwards, you know, Mr. President, none of that would have happened without Milan Panish. And he said, you're absolutely right. Milan Panish has led an incredible life uh, and had an incredible journey, uh, starting out as a young man of 14, as a Tito partisan in Yugoslavia, uh, becoming the cycling champion of uh, Yugoslavia, defecting from the country and communist country and then coming to the United States as an immigrant, making his way to California, uh, going to Caltech and then beginning and founding his own pharmaceutical company uh, in the garage of his home with 200 bucks and an old washing machine uh, and built that company ICN Pharmaceuticals into a four billion dollar company. Uh, during the time he was head of ICN he was invited back and accepted uh, an offer to become prime minister of his homeland, Yugoslavia, under President Slobodan Milosevic, the, uh, yes, the same Milosevic. Uh, and he ended up, of course, because Milosevic was pro-war and uh, Mr. Panish was pro-peace, he ended up clashing with Milosevic, unable to convince Milosevic that the war was a mistake, and so he ran for president of Yugoslavia against Slobodan Milosevic. Uh, I went over as a friend of Mr. Panish and helped him, and I'm still convinced that when the votes that, uh, that Milan Panish won the election, but Slobodan Milosevic counted the votes. Uh, and uh, Mr. Panish came, came back to this country, but he, while he was there in Yugoslavia, he was able to get all the parties, European parties together in a London peace conference. And then after he left Yugoslavia, was able to convince President Clinton to summon all the parties together for the Dayton Peace Accords, which ended up bringing peace to that region. Uh, all of that, again, the work of Milan Panish, and all of that that he relates uh, in his book, uh, Prime Minister for Peace which we're going to talk about this evening. So we'll be in conversation for just uh, a few minutes and then open up to questions from the audience and uh, Mr. Ponge will be glad to uh, stay with you and visit with you and sign any copies of the books that you might want. So we'll do that. Are you ready? Uh, 
these microphones. They're on. Yep. <laughs> They're on. Yes. Are they? Right. Okay. Good. So, Mr. Pine, first of all, why why did you feel as a young man you wanted to leave Europe, leave Yugoslavia, and come to the United States? What was what was what, what attracted you to the United States, and then what appealed to you about California? Why did I leave? Close. Why did I leave the communist Yugoslavia then? <coughs> I made a blunder in one of the meetings at the University of Belgrade. I called communism intellectual disgrace. For that, you go to jail. Well, I didn't. For whatever reason, uh, I, they did not get me to jail, but that was truly my feelings about Yugoslavia at that time. So as a young man, you know, you have lots of ideas. I was athlete, and I decided on one of the trips to representing Yugoslavia as a, by a cycling champion of Yugoslavia, I decided not to go back. And my idea was to come to United States. I, I didn't know that that is not as easy as I thought you should be, especially when I see those big lines of people waiting to get to United States by some fortune, by some, I don't still know why, they picked me out of the line and took me into the embassy to talk to me. And I didn't know why they did, but they did. The next thing, I, by some fortune, and it's got to be some reason, I don't know which one. Maybe I'll tell you the end of the story, which I just learned recently. Uh, I, I received a borderline invitation to come to America. My trip was paid, and I'm starting to think, what is now going on with this? I don't need a payment. I don't need that. This something is there. Well, I didn't find out. Never anything happened. All my old communist think, thinking, like the communists do in Yugoslavia, was wrong. Except, recently a guy wrote an article about me and he wanted to find out who paid the trip. And he finds out that CIA paid my trip. <laughs> oh my God, I said, now after 50 years, 60, I finally knew what was wrong, that I felt something is going wrong. So I was a lucky guy. They, they never asked me, ever, never did I hear from them, but I was lucky enough that pay, the trip was paid. I, I, I love America then because I, I learned about America in American library. American public relation is uh, close to disaster. You can not read anything good about America almost anywhere, communist country. And so I, I, I had to go to library, and the only good thing about American library was they give you the book and they said, you don't need to bring it back, give it to somebody. I said, God, something correct. Anyway, it was great to, based on information about America in American library, I decided it is America I'm going to go. And of course, if there is a will, there is a way. Once I was out of Yugoslavia, I told to my friends, I'm leaving to address then the problem of CIA, Interpol, this is that, and lots of things, because I was a prospect of being a wrong person to come to America. Well, so, we are lucky. You're lucky you came to America. I am lucky, of course. We are lucky you came to America. Thank you. Why California? Thank you. You landed in now, New California, York. I analyzed the United States. I knew tomatoes, prices, bread prices, <laughs> everything. I knew that I could survive on minimum wages. Of course, it was not to be. So I, I learned lots about the United States. I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. And the people were fantastic. I arrived to the United States, and I was basically the great thing about America and all of us, especially you Serbs or Yugoslavs, is that the people accept you. That's unusual for Europe. You're not immediately accepted in France or Germany or other countries. 
And in America, it was a different world. I felt so good, so comfortable. And I did another thing which probably you, you should know. I, because of communist background, I analyzed United States Constitution. And I said, what a document. <laughs> I meant that. So I learned, I learned later that it is a unique document. I decided on my own that it is a fantastic document. So in America we have, I have found two important things. That document, constitution, which nobody thinks about, but it's super document for immigrant. And people, people accept you as, as, as their own. And this was magnificent because the Germans don't do that, French don't do that. None of nationality or ethnic groups are like Americans. So, so once, once in Europe, I had the benefits after many years to make a speech and tell Europeans before European Union, you will look one day like United States. Didn't get applauded <laughs> to lots right. of people. Yeah. So I want to flash forward. You're in California now for decades. You're a very successful businessman. You're a patriotic, proud Amer American citizen. And you get a call from President Milosevic to come be his prime minister in Yugoslavia. We have sanctions against Yugoslavia. The world hates Yugoslavia. Why do you accept that job? Well, uh, I was at the beginning, like probably most of you which came from Yugoslavia, I was very upset with our country, with our with regime, with people, with country, with police, with everything else. Because it is difficult for all of us to leave our place. Much more difficult then Americans, Americans move from one city to another, that's very easy. But in Europe, at my time, people don't move. You live where your parents lived or your grandparents. My God, I come here, everybody, you. that's not <laughs> standard. So I, I, I decided to come to California because I studied the place which I'm going to like. Most of all, my idea was to go to Caltech. That's one of the great schools in America, but in the world. So the idea of going to California was a school. But why accept Milosevic's invitation? Why to accept? Why did you accept to well, be his prime minister? No, I think that the answer for that is very clear. I was reasonably successful American, and I thought I could help him. That really was flat that there was nothing, there was no way for me to make money. I made already what I was to make for my life. So uh, Yugoslavia offered nothing but the potential problems. People told me not to do, my best friends, Yugoslavs told me, don't do it, don't do it. But I felt really a sort of obligation toward the place I was born in. And you know that, it's like feeling for the city you are born, or feeling for states in the United States, or for America if you are abroad. So I went back. So you talk about oil and water. Here's Mr. Milosevic who believes war is the answer, and your philosophy is just the opposite. Yeah. No, uh, that is uh, totally correct. I, I, I think that he, first I have to tell you something, he flat lied to me. I said, I will come back only if you leave the politics. And I even decided that I would be nice to him. I said, look, you have a family, why don't you, and you're a former banker, I'll provide capital, we'll start Serbian American Bank, you move to America. I talked to American officials in embassy, they said, you're not going to make that, but we'll do it. Let us check. And they checked, they said, we'll approve the move. But he's not going to go, Milan, he's lying to you. The ambassador said, you don't understand. He said, maybe he's not lying to me because I'm going to make him leave. <laughs> well, that was a <laughs> wish. Anyway, the uh, situation didn't start well because uh, when I came there, 
and she's not leaving and I said but you promised to leave he says I don't remember I said you know something you happen to be a liar <laughs> <laughs> with them he drank a little too much for her lunch and I unleashed I have told him so many bad things that he really borderline emotionally collapsed and that's not healthy I don't advise anybody to do it because that's dangerous he presses the button and somebody kills me <laughs> and for whatever reason emotions drove me to that extent that I risk my life by telling them why did he do that I didn't need to come so anyway he was to think more we met one more times and that story is even more dramatic uh, yeah tell us about so that was, the, you, I am living the near him I was living near him somehow he allocated me the home it was old communist system they tell you where you're gonna live so nice home and everything was okay and one evening he shows up at my home already intoxicated but he can drink a lot because he was pretty big guy and big guys can drink more than small guy I'm relatively small compared to him and I drink wine he drinks scotch so anyway he was drinking more with me more with me and I became terrible I have never remembered myself addressing any person like I did him because I consider myself reasonably maybe not nice guy but not bad person <laughs> and here with him I told him that he's he is not only terrible he's sick he belongs to institution and no one I, I mean I just couldn't stop and he I, I, but I get, the lecture was not short it was 15 20 minutes and he's taking it and I see the changes and he puts his hands gets the revolver from his whatever gives it to me he said if you really believe that you shoot me I take that revolver and I throw it I said you are worse than I thought you're not sick you belong to institution they should you have children you have wife you have everything you don't need to do that and she says but the way you talk to a man should he had, a, he had a gun in his the government had a gun was it, do you no, know if it was loaded I, no, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> that question I was asked many times you didn't try no I would never try I am I after the second I'm old guy as you can see uh, and I went through the Second World War I don't believe in killing I am hundred percent against capital punishment any killing for any reason I think we have to find a way not to be what the killers are and I'm against wars so here is a supposedly Serb who is nothing for the fighting guys our image is terrible in world and I made more speeches on peace than I think maybe any other Serb in so many places from United General Assembly United Nations where I started my speech by telling now you will hear the speech about the speech about the peace and I spoke to many conferences I also talked to President Mitterrand ask him to organize conference for me so that I can present peace for Balkans because it was a terrible thing Serbs killing Croats, Croats, I mean everybody killing I mean I, and I don't believe in killing at all so I had really if I could just jump in so this is what became the London conference that's correct? I, I, I met Mr. Mitra and I said I need a place where I can present the, the, the a, a, a way for to peace on Balkans then after short period he trusted me he says you are refreshment to Europe and strange enough you come from Serbia and those are people which are creating problems I said I need a forum so we can put a peace together so he says I'll do it I thought we'll have a French in Paris conference on peace he says no 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 the conference is going to be in England and you're going to talk to Prime Minister Major who was then Prime Minister 
And for whatever reason, anecdotally, I said, well, how, how am I going to get in touch with him? Well, he said, same as you did with me. Call him on the telephone. <laughs> So, next thing I met Major and the London Conference was organized. And it was nice to see the old world there and the Major in his opening speech, he says, I thought of, of peace. So I said, no, I, if there is a peace, I better somebody thinks of it. And that's me since I started. So I spent nights and days thinking of points and they had to be 12 points I decided and those 12 has to be no more than two sentences each but as you know I'm a Serbian origin my English is still not as good as it should be but then was even worse and I couldn't really write too well so one of my colleagues or one of my co-worker was Ambassador Scanlin, American ambassador in Serbia, Yugoslavia. And I asked him to write my points, my 12 points, and I said, you can't change substance, please just fix the English. He does, and here peace conference in London. And comes Mr. Major and starts the conference welcoming, and then he said something which I'll be happy forever, or honored forever that he, he said, as Mr. Panic in his 12 points proposal for peace to United Nations, we will consider his points and those points will be points of peace. And of course, my head got a little bigger. <laughs> one, <laughs> certainly one of the things that you're most proud of. You know, we have, so you were dealing with that situation in the Balkans. Today, there is still war in in uh, Iraq. We're winding down the war in Afghanistan. There's the beginnings of a war, it looks like, in the eastern Ukraine. But they're not the only places on the planet. Is war the ever, ever the answer? War is never the answer. And the worst thing is that every war could be stopped. Just think, Serbs. Pretty tough cookies, Croats, just the stuff, no, no difference, all love fighting. Then Muslim, a little bit on the non-Muslim side, equally bad to fight, so everybody killing each other, and here I am, I'm saying I'm going to stop that. That's pretty big order for a poor little American immigrant coming to Serbs to tell him they have to stop shooting. And, you know, at the end, Dayton was there and I'm smiling saying, oh my God, look at this, from this saying, I will put the piece together, I'll write the piece, points, we have a London conference, London conference was total success, my points, everybody agrees, Milosevic agrees, signs, my 12 points, goes back to Yugoslavia and in a newspaper big, proposal of punish in London, which was accepted that President Milosevic has been rejected by Parliament. Mm. Who did it? Milosevic, because told him, vote against this. So this was terrible, terrible, terrible. So here all those efforts and everything didn't result in peace. So for me, I'm thinking now, so what's the next way to build a peace? So I'm sitting in a plane, I come to see President Clinton. Said that thing didn't work. You are going to do it. <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm going to put the peace on Balkan. He said, that's correct. He says, no way, these are criminals. I said, yes, yes, they're criminals, but there is way to peace. And I, said, I even said to him, Mr. President, I want you to be such a peacemaker. So like Carter used to have the Jews and... Camp David. Camp David. With the, with the two, three of them standing behind, you should stand behind Milosevic, Tujman, Izerbegovic. And he says, they're all criminals. I said, I know. I called my everything, but we need a peace. And finally, he agrees after the fifth meeting and 25 letters. And some of the letters are in a book, which I wrote and borderline begged President Clinton to take the peace role, and he succeeds. And that was beautiful. So 
so. it, the peace can be done in under worst condition I tell you it's, uh, it's not nice to say that Croats are no good and and the Bosnians or Muslims are no good and Serbs are no good they're all the same so if you provide them with reason to have peace they will listen so what's the problem their leadership Dutchman, Milosevic, and Izerbegovic, all of them benefited from fighting because if they say there is a danger, they stay in power. I found out. Milosevic wanted to have an enemy so the Serbs will vote for him. Same for Tujman and same for Izerbegovic. Tragedy. You mentioned the London Peace Conference and the Dayton Accords, two of your greatest uh, achievements that you real, that wouldn't have happened without you. Um, I, I want to leave some time for questions here, but I want to ask you, you know so many of the world leaders today, you're still in touch with them. So I want to ask you quickly, kind of what advice, now you have an office in Moscow, you go to Moscow, you know President Putin, you know what he's up to in the Ukraine, what's your best advice to Vladimir Putin? I, <laughs> I gave the speech in Moscow, it was with front page news, Dayton of Ukraine, <laughs> Panish recommends to Putin. Plenty of publicity I got, and then he heard it, and he knows me, I mean, I know, I know him. He was, I met him, and I find it not to be an unreasonable guy. He was assistant to Sobchak, who was mayor of St. Petersburg. I was the first, first guy who went into communist Russia, which broke up, uh, to go and buy the company for business. And who is the guy, the mayor, was object who says, Mr. Panish, I know nothing about business, but I have a smart assistant. And he says, Vladimir, come here on the telephone, here walks Putin. So we worked on putting acquisition together. Even I did a little more for them because I wanted to give to each to each worker a stock in ICN, New York Stock Exchange Company. I was on New York Stock Exchange 50 years, rules, regulations of business I knew. So anyway, uh, the, the Putin was excited about this. So here the certificates are brought in bags to Moscow and we are to give to to the people. Putin said to me, we got the problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, two, three days ago, somebody knowing what you and I are doing, forced Duma to vote that the Russians cannot own foreign stocks. Just a days. Politic, not against me, against Sobchak, against, because Sobchak was candidate for president. And Putin was to help him. And so, anyway, uh, he says we have to come up with idea what to do with these certificates. He came with the idea of one day too. He says I have idea. We'll put certificate in the bank, and we should we should uh, what they call them some Russian term for the piece of paper which says that they own something, but it's not really there. It's owned by the bank, the bank. but they have a right on it. So that he he was so clever to do that. Did you talk to him about the Ukraine? No. You also know, um, and known for a long time, Secretary of State John Kerry. You know President Obama, and you've met him several times. What's your advice to them today with the hot spots around the world? And a lot, of, a lot of people in the United States Congress are saying, you know, we have to bomb Iran, or we have to bomb Ukraine, or we have to whatever. Start send more troops to Iraq. I mean, it's, the, the war talk is always around Washington. What, What's your advice? What I'm going to tell you, the Serbs will take my Serbians' background citizenship. I am against any war. I think policy of the United States government, and specifically State Department, which I have a lot problem with, which advises presidents to declare wars or bomb or this, to stop that. We are the strongest country of the world. We should be exemplar of peace. We should teach people how to live together. We should provide them with the, with the help for peace. The bombs, I said to students, the time of bombs is over. I got huge applause on that statement. And I believe in that. 
And especially, look, we are the strongest country. We don't need to teach people democracy with bombs. We should teach them with example of how to live, how we live, what our laws are, how our laws can be applied in their countries. And that's easier said than done because Putin, which I don't know, you, you don't know the guy, he, he is devastated with the minimum help he got from the United States. We never hear that. But he, for instance, said, where is the help from America to help me how to change this system from communism to democracy, <coughs> which I wanted, uh, or from communism into capitalistic system? There was no help. There was even, he said once, you know, there was such a big deal about Star War of Peace. How about Star War, Star War of Guantanamo, whatever. He said, how about Star War of Peace coming from America? He was upset that no help. Right. We did not help Putin. He finally said on television, look, if you don't help me, I'm going to do it my own way, which is not going to be necessarily same in America. So there is a lot of things which we should do, <coughs> which State Department is not doing. I, I, have a, I have a very bad feeling about our State Department uh, because of the bombing. I right. think any, any solution by State Department to any problem with the world is Americans should send the bombs. The crime of bombing and bombs and all that weaponry should go into a museum, and that Pentagon should be converted into a museum. <laughs> that, I said that in Washington too, and I also got a little so, bomb. Let and me I, just let, let me just. So you, I think you are getting a little field in spite of me being a little over. Overwhelming on that. No, we, right. Very clear. We are strongest country. We don't need to bomb anybody. We should help Message. everybody. Message received, and it was just a, a month or so ago uh, that Mr. Panish also met with Vice President Joe Biden in California, uh, and the Vice President, who was at that time, at the time we we're talking about, was the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and he said to Mr. Ponish, if only we had listened more to you back then, we'd be a lot better off today as a country uh, than thank we are. You. Mr. Ponish, we thank you for all your efforts, and uh, thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> so, Emily, will you uh, entertain questions? Oh, Absolutely. I'm we're actually going to do a few audience questions Sorry. and then we're going to leave a moment at the end for a nice little video before we have your book signed. Perfect. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. I'll go ahead and bring you a mic. Mr. Panish, I'm your age. You are from Vozdoz. I am from Be Belgrade too. Uh, what year did you leave Yugoslavia? I left August 1, August 1, 1956. I left 14 1965. October, I left 14 October 1956. Also, second, yeah. Second oh. question. I have your book, Balkan Prorok, and John Scanlon, who I knew and met as a as a friend, as well as ambassador, told you not to do, and you went to Belgrade. <laughs> According to your book, yes. the third question is: What do you say about Robert Badinter, French lawyer? You quoted him, but then, but he was very who decided the future of Yugoslavia. Robert Badinter. That's quite some time ago. I the name is Robert McClintock. Yeah, you know, I recognize the name. I just can't remember connection. Sorry. Maybe because of our age. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you remember, but you had the help of a book. I don't recall. I'm sorry. Okay. Another question? Sure. Right. I, 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 if I do, I'll. Yeah. We know each other. You were my prime minister. I was in your government. Oh. My name is Radmila Milentievich. And I have, I'm glad to see you here tonight, but I have a couple of, the, of questions. One is, you left Yugoslavia as I did. Being a Serb, as I am, as we all are, what motivated you to erase your name from the, day, from the book of 
born Serbs and not be, be Serb anymore. Because when you wanted to run for the president of, for the president of Serbia, of, of Yugoslavia, you would not, you couldn't. President Milosevic made it possible for you because legally you couldn't because you erase your, your name from, from the Serbian books as being born there. What was the reason for it? I what am, motivated you, I number am. one? Number two, what motivated you then to run for president of Serbia? What qualifications do you think you had? And what did you have to offer to Serbia running against President Milosevic? I, I am, the, for the first question I'm going to answer to you. Uh, why did I go back to Yugoslavia? First, why I left Yugoslavia, it's a communist country. I thought communism is a bad thing. I think that uh, what made me think that I'm qualified to be president of Yugoslavia. I think every person should be given a chance to be president of any country. That question is borderline non-democratic. We shouldn't forbid anybody because he's stupid not to be president. That's needless to say that sometimes we did select some people which were not smart, so smart. Or some people like Milosevic elected himself. He was not elected by people. The machinery elected him. Communist bunch elected him. My popularity in Yugoslavia was 97%. He had no popularity, but he won because people which, like Mrs. Milentievich, did not understand the concept of communism. And therefore, she never understood how I could be a president. So that's why we had that question. I had the problems, if you noticed, with Mrs. Milentievich. So this is not the first. But America is a free country. You can ask any question. I'll be glad to answer. Please. Uh, and here, yes. So this is going to seem like a softball question after that one, but as a former cycling champion, do you continue to follow the state of cycling in the world today? And do you have any opinions on the drug scandals that have uh, oh, that they have been hear? facing? No, I, no. The question is whether or not, with your background in cycling, that you follow cycling professional today, or the, the professional sport of cycling today. Uh, have you uh, have you entered the Tour de France? No, I did not. I did not enter Tour de France. But there is a race uh, in communist countries at my time. There was no professional sports. You had to be amateur. Uh, amateurs. Uh, cannot take payments and you cannot compete against professionals. In France there is a race called Tour de France is the biggest race bicycling. Of course that was my dream if I ever get there. But I, there is one race before that which is called Route de France. In the race Route de France I represented Yugoslavia with the four other guys. Hmm. So I, I came reasonably high. I was three times champion of Yugoslavia, too. And if you look, there's a photo in the, in the book, in the front of the book of Mr. Uh, Panish uh, leading the race through uh, Belgrade, I guess it is. But yeah, you can see he was in good form. Give it. <laughs> is, is a microphone there? Yes. Okay. I was not in a good form, but they said I you have were. a good chance. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Panish, it was really a pleasure to listen to you, and I'm glad I'm here tonight. I just, uh, I'm a medical doctor from Tito's communist country, and I'm very proud that I've got my diploma in communist Yugoslavia, which was the happiest part of my life. I left in 92 because Milosevic came. I happened to be on a scholarship in England. And my question to you is, with regard to all, with, you, with regard to Dayton uh, peace and the situation in currently in uh, ex-Balkan countries, with regard to Bosnia, I uh, don't know when you were there last time or if you're following. Do you think is there a peace in Bosnia today? I think the end, is there a peace in Bosnia today? I think yes. I don't think there are killings and there is no... Uh, you would hear it, the, pre the country is reasonably free and there are foreign uh, journalists, so we would know. There is no killing in Bosnia, I think. And that's great. I'm so glad. I believe that I helped a little. Um, 
the, that your one question. The Belgrade, you, you studied in Belgrade. There is something uh, good about, uh, there is one good thing, I think, in communist system, education. I think they had a system which is less voluntary in education, which provides the better base for directing young people than total freedom which we have here. You can select anything you want to do. Uh, so they, I think they were more planned education than we do in free countries. I think also planned economy, like today Chinese economy, it's far easier to be successful than, than economy like ours. In my speech at the University of Beijing, I told him, just wait to see your problem of capitalism when you become true free capitalist country. And they, some understood, some didn't. So I think communist education was not bad. You got to give him credit. Uh, I think that. It is good of you that you were educated. There was nothing wrong with the schools. Well, thank you, Mr. Panish. We are unfortunately running low on time for the evening, so we do want to show everybody the video portion before we get to uh, you signing books. So if we okay. could get the lights down in the back, please. Hey, I've never met anybody with more energy, never met anybody who's more driven, more dedicated to his work and to his family and to his country. I think my dad is amazing. I think my dad is Superman. He is a hero. He always wanted to accomplish the impossible, and he usually did. My father died when I was two. So my mother raised me. Extraordinary human being. I think she taught me never to quit. She taught me to be honest and straight. My family is most important to me. My family members were already in underground resistance. To them, I joined the resistance. And I said to myself, when I grow up, I will be never, I hope I never see wars. Unfortunately, I'm seeing it, but I decided I will be working on peace the rest of my life. I think his legacy is that he brought peace to the Balkans, which is no small feat. He was very sincere in wanting to do what he could to bring peace to his country. My mission was very simple. It was peace, peace, peace. People were killing each other without purpose. They're killing for borders. We must stop the killing. He said it over and over, and it animated his every day and his entire existence. Today, I will present you with an argument and a program for more peace. I think Nobody ever achieved to gather together five foreign ministers of five permanent members of Security Council of United Nations. And Mr. Panic was alone fighting like a tiger against those five greats. No was not in his vocabulary. And if Mr. President Milosevic or anyone else fails to live up to each and every one of these mandates for peace, I'll personally lead fight against them. He finally got Prime Minister John Major and President Mitterrand to call a peace conference in London, and they adopted Milan's proposal for peace for the Balkan. And then the Major opens the conference saying, we will accept his points and the peace will come. I met with President Clinton and told him, you should put the peace. I convinced him he accepts and after considerable resistance the Dayton was organized and it worked at the end it worked my father places a lot of importance on peace and i think that stems from growing up and at such a young age having to go through world war ii and its devastation after the war there was no business i would be involved other than helping people, and the closest to that concept was pharmaceutical business. His company developed this drug, ribavirin, which has saved tens of thousands of lives of tiny infants with lung disease who can't be inoculated. He helped save my son's life 
The riboferrin was an essential part of the treatment for a young boy who was born with a severe heart defect that had other complications. He saved a lot of lives. We have the drug to treat viral diseases. It was something absolutely new. And our first use of a drug was to treat babies with respiratory syncytial virus. Our drug ribavirin eliminated disease in a particle which was used for warfare. The size of the particle used now to help the babies. I have succeeded, I felt. I think my father's generous because he came to America with nothing and it was a land of opportunity and it gave him so much and he wanted to give back. He's just one of those rare individuals that doesn't come along very often, if ever, more than once. Mill promotional. I didn't make the film. <laughs> On behalf of